And uh, as you can see, uh, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation and also the support to come here. It's really great to be in Italy again. I've not been since the pandemic, and it's nice to see some familiar faces again. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, neutron induced reactions with a text at TPC, mainly focusing on neutron inelastic upscattering. So here is an overview of the uh, talk. I'm going to start by introducing the phenomena for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, talk a little bit about the Texat TPC device, uh, some of the steps that we had to go along the way to see if we could actually make this measurement, and then show you the uh, results that we managed to obtain. Okay, so what is the neutron scattering phenomena? So the idea is that here we're focusing on the triple alpha process, so we're bringing the alpha particles together, we form the intermediate beryllium 8, we get the third alpha particle sticking on, and we're populating the Hoyle state. But in order to actually create the carbon-12 to, uh, to complete the cycle of the triple alpha process, it needs to undergo usually either the sequential gamma decay through the, the two plus. Uh, you can get pair production, but this is a lot smaller. And the idea is that if you have a very high neutron density, what can happen is that one of these low energy neutrons can actually come along when you're still in the Hoyle state, and it can basically steal away some of that energy. And you, you have a low energy neutron coming in, a high energy neutron going out, and this allows you to either go to the two plus state or the ground state. And this is an additional way to actually uh, to drive the, uh, the transition down to the carbon 12 ground state. So what this is really doing is this is just increasing the radiative, radiative decay branching ratio. So the kind of way that we uh, wanted to tackle this is what we wanted to do is employ the time reversal symmetry. Obviously, we can't just do uh, this experiment that is uh, happening in these stars uh, on Earth. So what we wanted to do is we want to think about this time reversed astrophysical case. So you have three alpha particles coming in, low energy neutron going in, and you get carbon-12 uh, and a high-energy neutron coming out. So what we do is we look in our time reversal mirror and everything starts to go backwards. So what we're looking at here is we have a high-energy neutron coming in. It's blasting the carbon-12. We're breaking apart into three alpha particles, and we get a low-energy neutron coming out. I mean, this is just inelast neutron inelastic scattering. And what we can do then is we can use detailed balance to relate these two processes together. So how much is high is high energy? Uh, so the neutron energy range is between 8.2 to 10 MeV. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing we want to do when we think about this process is you look to see, has anyone measured this beforehand? So on the left-hand side, what we have as a function of the neutron lab energy is the inelastic scattering cross-sections for various different reactions. So you can see uh, it, the actual uh, points here are data points, and these uh, lines here are how's the feshback predictions. So you can see there's a lot of data for the scattering from the ground state to the two plus state. You know, this is fairly easy to measure. You can just pick up the 4.4 MeV gamma ray. Um, but if we look in the green here, looking at the, the ground state to the Hoyle state, we see that there's a few data points uh, and much higher energies, but around the astrophysically interesting region. So the threshold is 8.2 MeV up to around 10 MeV. There's obviously no data. And uh, there's even a little bit of uh, uncertainty from the Heiser Feshbach prediction as well. Okay, so uh, using the house of fresh product predictions, uh, the, uh, there was a paper by Beard et al, and what they actually did is they um, looked at the expected enhancement of the, uh, this neutron upscattering in uh, the triple alpha reaction process. They took an arbitrary uh, neutron density, which is actually quite high, of 10 to 6 grams per cubic centimeter, and uh, they looked at the uh, enhancement they expected. This is actually the wrong figure. And what they actually saw was that if you have 10 to the 6 uh, neutrons, uh, grams of neutron per cubic centimeter, you see a rate enhancement of something over a factor of 100. So they were kind of arguing this is a very important process. Um, so we were like, okay, it's, it's all very well and good having has a feshback, but has a feshback sucks, as we know. So we wanted to get some experimental data to verify this. Okay, so we had the, uh, the goals at the uh, end of, uh, that's where we wanted to be. So what we uh, started to do is we started to use a new device that was uh, commissioned in 2017 at the Cyclotron Institute uh, known as TechSat. So TechSat is a time projection chamber. For those who haven't seen it before, it's a fairly simple idea. Uh, a time projection chamber works as you have some gas that is filling uh, a volume. You have a charged particle that passes through it. As you do that, obviously, you're going to create electron hole pairs. And then with just an electric field, we're going to drift those electrons and we're going to collect them on some sort of position sensitive pad. 
And what we can do is we can look at uh, the, the sort of uh, line that is traced on the, uh, the position sensitive pad. That gives us one projection. But what we can also do is we can also look at the arrival time of each of these electrons, and that gives us the third dimension. So what this really allows us to do is to get a full 3D image of any charged particles that are inside the TPC device. So our solution to this is the Texas TPC. Uh, so the, position, the sensitive area is uh, 224 by 240, so about yay big. And the way that we have our segmented readout is using the very common uh, and popular Micromegas readout. So we have 1,024 uh, of these, um, these channels, which give us the position sensitivity. And that corresponds to about 1.5 millimeters uh, in the, the direction of the beam. So when we're looking at very uh, low energy deposition particles, uh, such as we'll be coming to soon, uh, we wanted to get some additional gain. So we have the uh, intermediate gas electron multipliers. And uh, what this uh, does is basically just a high electric field uh, between the top and the bottom. So as you get these drift electrons come in, you get a Townsend and avalanche, you end up with more electrons coming out. So when we eventually read it uh, in, our, uh, in our electronics, so we use the GET system, what that does is that fully digitizes the, the waveform. So this electron signal is then shaped. And we sampled that uh, in this work uh, with 512 time buckets at 10 megahertz. Uh, so this is the CAD on the right-hand side. So obviously, you the TPC mainly is just a big ch uh, chunk of gas. So there's nothing super interesting to look at. Um, but you can see that uh, surrounding it, we have these uh, silicon cesamidae telescope walls as well. So if we have any charged particles that are then going to be exiting the uh, TPC volume, because it's a relatively low uh, pressure gas, then the residual energy can be picked up in these. OK. So, and uh, as I pointed out before, all we need to do then is uh, we look at the time, we look at the position, this gives us a full 3D track. So I have pointed out the micromegas and uh, it may be fairly hard to see, but because uh, the pads themselves are quite small, but this is uh, just a view of uh, what the segmentation looks in, uh, in the Texat TPC. So in the central region, we have much better pixelation. We have actual pixels. So they're 3.5 by 1.75 millimeters. Uh, and because this was kind of the first iteration uh, in the side, we actually have to uh, connect a large number of these pads together. So we have uh, strips going uh, left, right, and we have chains which go up, down. And we need to do a little bit of reconstruction to actually uh, to get what's going on in these side regions. Um, OK, so I mean, one of the questions is, why are we talking about a TPC? You know, there's all sorts of wonderful devices and things like that. It seems fairly complicated to go to all the effort of developing this. Uh, and one of the key advantages, of course, of a TPC is that when you perform these studies with these radioactive ion beams, you have, typically have a very low intensity. So really, every ion counts. So what you want to do there is you want to maximize both the target thickness, thickness and you also want to maximize the efficiency as well. So the nice thing about a TPC is that you can have this very thick target without any loss of resolution because the interaction that is going to be taking place inside of your target is also your sensitive medium. So you're not really losing any information there. And of course, with a TPC, it doesn't really matter which direction the particles are going in because they're always going to be inside of the gas and you're going to be able to see what's going on. And in this particular work, one very nice thing about TPC is as well is that we have these extremely low energy thresholds. So as I'll be showing you a little bit later, we're really going to be looking at alpha particles that are coming out with, you know, 100 kV all the way up to 1 MeV. So these uh, won't be very well uh, exemplified by uh, silicon detectors. So one of the key aims of the Texas TPC is to explore and demonstrate uh, the capabilities of TPCs to study light reaction, uh, night, light nuclear structure and reactions relevant to astrophysics. And we're currently working on the next upgrade of Texas, which is called Tibet. Okay, and uh, so I'd like to point out the fact that, uh, I mean, there's one other talk by Moshi, but I think TPCs uh, uh, have a, a lot to offer in the area of nuclear astrophysics, and we should start thinking about uh, using them more for some of these uh, experiments where we, where we really need them. Okay, and here's just a summary of some of the past experiments that we've actually managed to uh, do with the Texas TPC. So we do a lot of work looking at uh, nuclear structure and exotic nuclei. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, here, we're looking at the low lying states of carbon nine. Uh, we do some cluster st studies. We've also managed to pack the whole thing up and send it to Triumph. And we did an experiment there to 
uh, understand the uh, low-lying states and the ground state of beryllium-13 through isobaric analog states, uh, uh, like we did with uh, lithium-9 uh, going to lithium-10 as well. And we also built a neutron detector with it that's uh, highly segmented and sits behind it as well. We can do direct fusion measurements as well. So here we had an argon gas. We sent a boronate beam. And what we can do is we can physically see the fusion inside, uh, inside of the gas volume. And you don't have to measure any of the uh, light reaction products as well. So there's no model uncertainty or anything like that there. And uh, we've worked with a group of Tanya in the past as well to start thinking about whether you can do some kind of Trojan horse method, method studies there. So uh, here we were looking at uh, alpha plus neon 20. Uh, going to alpha plus oxygen 16. Yeah. We can do transfer reactions. We've done uh, beta delayed uh, particle implantation. So you have a radioactive beam, you stop it inside of the gas, you look at the, re the reaction products. And of course, we're going to move towards it looking at neutron induced measurements. Okay, so the first thing we asked ourselves is can we actually do this measurement? You know, there's no point getting the beam time going there until you can really demonstrate that the quality of the data you have out of it is going to be useful enough to give you a good answer. So what we did along the way is we uh, first tested uh, the ability of TechSat to reconstruct these three low energy alpha particles. So in order to do this, what we did is we sent a beam of nitrogen 12 uh, at uh, Cyclotron Institute. So this is generated by the uh, mass spectrometer uh, generated from the K500. We send the nitrogen 12 inside of Texat, it stops, and it has a uh, half-life of uh, 11 milliseconds. And then what we do is we look at the 2% of events where as the nitrogen 12 beta decays, it populates states in carbon 12 that are above the alpha threshold. So you see the decay then into three alpha particles. So here is uh, a three rota rotating uh, 3D example of this kind of track that we see inside Texat. And you can very clearly see the decay vertex here, and then you see the three alpha particles. So it seems to work pretty well. <laughs> and there's obviously a lot of work uh, to get to this point here. So one of the first applications that we actually did is we wanted to uh, test the, the sensitivity of this uh, reconstruction technique by looking at the uh, decay of the Hoyle state directly into three alpha particles. So most of the time as it alpha decays, you go through the intermediate beryllium eight, but what we did is we looked at the uh, very fine structure of these uh, three alpha particles, and you can actually differentiate uh, between uh, sequential decay through beryllium-8 or direct alpha decay, because the preferable alpha decay mode is where each of these three alpha particles uh, has a much more equal length. They kind of more equitably and democratically share the energy. And what we managed to do along the way is we demonstrated for the first time the sensitivity to the direct decay component. So that was very nice. And this is an example of one of these uh, direct uh, looking decays here. Okay, and kind of a for free along the way, we also did a bit of fMR physics. Um, so there was the question of whether there was this uh, state in carbon-12 at 7.458 MeV, which is the fMR or Thomas state. And because of the really low energy threshold of the TPC, uh, this was another neat way to kind of see how low we could actually do go. So when we had these alpha decay events, what we can do is we just sum up the energy and you could then convert that to an excitation energy. And this large peak here is coming from the Hoyle state. And what we kind of did is look below and see if there's any, any extra low-lying states below uh, the Hoyle state. And what you can do is you can say, okay, this is the fit here. And you say the worst case scenario is that all of this stuff here is from some kind of other state in carbon-12. But uh, what I decided to do is also combine this with uh, some uh, previously taken gamma sphere data uh, so if you have a state that's very close to the alpha threshold, you know, at a certain point, it's going to start to prefer preferentially gamma decay. And uh, this is the region here where you would expect to see a peak. This, this uh, peak here is from the, the Hoyle state. And uh, you can do a statistical analysis here and also place a, a, a limit like that. And uh, what you can do then is if you combine the limit from gamma ray, the, the limit from alpha decay, uh, there's really nowhere else for the decay to actually go through. Um, and what you can do then is you can say, okay, if there is such a state, then it would have to be populated uh, at the sort of less than 1% level relative to the whole state. So really, if this state was here, we should have seen it. And this is really what it showed. There's also an astrophysical argument to this exact thing as well. 
Uh, so I did some calculations looking at the impact this would actually have on the triple alpha reaction rate. And if you include this, uh, this extra FMOV state, then what you can see is that we go from the, the blue line here uh, to the red line. And it's a little bit hard to see maybe, but this green point here is the pseudo limit. And if the triple alpha reaction rate goes above this uh, green point here, then it's such that the red giant phase of stars actually starts to become impossible. So there's another argument that if this state did exist, then you know red giant phase stars wouldn't uh, wouldn't be possible. But of course, we know that they are. So, but you say less than two percent. Uh, yes. So, so this this is the exclusion plot. So this is the ratio of beta strength. So you know one percent is here. It's actually less than that and you can do this as a function of the gamma ray branching ratio uh for the energy the gamma ray uh, branching ratio is actually favored and you can see that you know as you go towards a state that almost purely gamma decays it's down to the 10 to the minus four level so, so we're going to eight order of magnitude less so you don't have that eight orders of magnitude less for what then the oil strength. for beta feeding strength yeah, but this this is as a function of the beta feeding strength. So, okay, so we managed to show that we can reconstruct the three alpha particles, and we got a little bit of uh, free physics along the way. So let's uh, think about applying this now to our neutrino induced measurements. So. Uh, what we wanted to do in this case is uh, we wanted to fill the uh, Texar TPC with CO2 gas. We're going to be firing neutrons into the TPC volume. We're going to be measuring the three alpha particles. So we're really measuring just the inelastic neutron scattering to the oil states. So the gas pressure that we chose was 50 tor of CO2. And uh, this is actually the first instance, at least that we know of, the neutro first neutron induced reactions measured with an active target TPC. So in order to do this, uh, we went over to our collaborators at the Edwards Accelerator Lab at Ohio University, and our experimental setup looked a little bit like this. So we had uh, you know, up, up to uh, three micrograms of a deuterium beam. This is then impinging on a deuterium gas cell. So this is eight centimeters long. It's quite a, a thick gas cell because we really need the yields of, of neutrons. And that's just backed by a gold foil to stop the, uh, the unreacted beam. And they've got this really beautiful uh, collimation system, which is uh, kind of done dirty by these uh, these little gray boxes. So once you're inside uh, the other side here, there's a 30 meter flight tunnel, and there's an incredibly low background there. These collimators really do a fantastic job at getting rid of any of the scattered neutrons or anything like that. Um, but for the case of statistics, what we did is we moved text out right up to the front of the collimator because we really wanted to make sure that we got every little last drop of neutrons that were produced. So because we're measuring the charged particles here, obviously normalization is going to be a pretty big issue. So the next thing that we had is we had a CH2 foil just inside of the Texat TPC. And in order, in order to uh, normalize the neutron flux, what we had is we measured the elastically scattered protons inside some silicon detectors here. So the, at this energy, the, the uh, MP scattering cross-section is incredibly well known. Um, so this actually provided a, a, a very good normalization. And as the neutron beam comes inside, it reacts with the CO2 gas. Then what we're gonna see in our device is all of a sudden we just see three alpha particles pop out of nowhere. We wanna measure those, reconstruct them and get a cross section out. So the final setup that we had, we had a neutron beam and we actually went down uh, lower than the astrophysical energy range. Um, so we went from 7.2 to 10 MeV because uh, we also wanted to do uh, sort of parasitically some measurements of the carbon 12 and alpha and the oxygen 16 and alpha uh, cross sections. Um, the oxygen 16 and alpha cross section in particular is an incredibly important one for the effective neutron multiplication factor in nuclear reactors. It has a 30% uncertainty at the moment and they wanted us to see if we could get that down to 5% or so. Okay, so one of the first things we did, uh, sorry, I should actually uh, point out that the, uh, the uh, neutron beam that we had uh, ended up with about five times 10 to the three neutrons per second. And because of the way that you actually um, you actually produce these neutrons, they're sort of quasi monoenergetic. You, depending on the target thickness and the beam energy, you can kind of choose how wide you want it. So as a bit of a trade-off between the intensity and the width, uh, our neutron uh, beam energy had a sort of intrinsic width of 200 kV. 
So first thing we wanted to do is make sure that we actually understand the neutrons we're getting out. Uh, so in order to do this, what we did is uh, we made sure that TexAt was out of the way. 30 meters away at the end of the tunnel, we had an NE213 detector and the uh, accelerator was running with timed uh, deuteron pulses. So using the timing at the time of flight of the neutron spectrum, what we could get is we could get an understanding of what the neutron energy is. So the data from the NE213 detector is shown in magenta with these error points. And then what I did is I developed uh, just a Gion4 simulation of the DDM reaction, going through all the steps of the gas cell, scattering everything like that. And that's shown in blue. So you can see that we have very good agreement between what we expected to see in terms of our neutron flux and what we actually measured with the NE213 detector. Okay, so what do these events actually look like inside the TPC? So we saw before that uh, when we were looking at something at rest, it was kind of like a little Y shape, but everything is actually sort of getting a, a momentum boost forward. So in this case, we have something a bit more like a trident. So we uh, we go through and we get tons of these really beautiful uh, trident events where you get the interaction point here and you get the three alpha particles sort of fired forward. And, uh, you know, doing this kind of TPC analysis, at a certain point, you have all these kind of events. It's a bit of a machine vision problem. You want to be able to identify event by event what exactly is going on. And you really want to just get the physics out of a, a cloud of points. So there's a, there was, again, a little bit of development there uh, in order to actually fit the tracks and to be able to separate these oil events. And at the end of the day, what you do is you go through, you make sure you have a list that is inclusive of all the good events and also some bad events. You just go, I always just went through, make sure the fit on every single one was okay. And you can sort of say, okay, that one's definitely a bad event and you get it away, um, which is very tedious. You know, fortunately for each beam energy, you only really have around 400, 600 events. Um, but it's it's really worth doing to make sure that you're getting the the answer that you want because this does end up being a, a pretty complicated uh, problem. Okay, so what do we get in terms of the cross section? So on this graph here, we have a few different things. So the red point is showing the threshold of the carbon twelve uh, inelastic scattering. We actually measured a point below the threshold just to make sure that something wasn't going horrendously wrong, and we were seeing three alpha events where it was below threshold. Um, so we just obviously could just place another limit on this, but we didn't see any. Um, and then the blue points are showing as a function of the neutron energy on the x-axis, uh, what exactly is going on. For reference, the original has a flashback prediction from Mary Beard is shown in the magenta. And straight away, you can see that the, uh, the, depend the dependence of the cross-section near the threshold is incredibly different. You know, uh, she kind of expected this huge rise all of a sudden, but we saw something a bit more mellow it's kind of, you know, you wait for the space, phase space or something like that to open up all the penetrability. And uh, we see the evidence of some, some sort of resonance or something like that here. Uh, when I first got these preliminary cross sections, oops, uh, I was like, oh, that kind of looks familiar. And uh, I actually looked at the, I was like, okay, this looks just like the carbon 12 and alpha zero cross section, uh, which is shown in the green. Um, so this is really good evidence that what we're really doing here is we're just going through the compound nucleus and uh, there's a series of states that are in this region that have a very good neutron width and then they also obviously have some um, some reasonable width to the uh, the Hoyle state as well. Okay, so one thing to bear in mind is that the inelastic scattering to the Hoyle state is not the only reaction with the three alpha particle final states. So if we have the carbon-12, N-alpha-1, and alpha-2, thank you, uh, we populate states in beryllium-9 that are uh, alpha unbound, so then those end up as two alpha plus neutron as well. Um, so by looking at the different, these, you know, by eye, you can really identify event by event without doing any kind of physics or anything like that what the separation is between these two ones. Obviously, we still went through and we looked at the, ex you know, you reconstruct the excitation energy, you look at the angles between them and everything like that. Um, so we also made sure that we we're actually separating this particular contribution as well. Um, our energy resolution wasn't quite good enough to do a perfect separation between the alpha one and alpha two channels. So we kind of just bundled them together because we don't really care too much about them. We just know that it's something we want to make sure it definitely doesn't make its way into our final cross section. Then you have that helium-5 Helium-5, beryllium-8. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess so, yeah. 
Um, but again, it's, it's probably one of those things where the phase space for that, the, the structure of those kind of widths is probably pretty poor. Cool. Yeah, and it's really broad as well. So it's it's kind of just a wash. But you can study the correlation between the, the way you detect the alpha particles, you can see if uh, you have some base of very nice technology. Yeah, so uh, it's in the back of slides, but perhaps I can come back and show that at the end. Yeah, we actually do the full invariant mass to reconstruct the, the whole states. Yeah. Okay, so as we saw before, we see the dominance of the compound nucleus. Um, so what I then decided to do was just to perform a multi-channel R matrix fit um, using a series of different data sets. Uh, so we have the, the elastic scattering, the scattering to the first excited state. We have our data in the blue. We have the N alpha zero. And uh, Carl Barini also suggested this data set here where they looked at beryllium nine alpha N2, so populating the whole state. Um, and then, as we know, our matrix sucks, but we managed to get something quite nice out of it. So it did this multi-channel R matrix fit, and you sort of get a reasonable agreement. So our data are down here. Um, and I don't actually have it here, but the boron 9 alpha N, uh, originally I left those out of the data. I uh, fit to all these other ones. I saw what we what it predicted for the beryllium 9 alpha N2, and it looked pretty much perfect straight away. So that was showing that something pretty good was uh, already happening. Okay, so now that we have a particular cross section, we wanted to understand what rate enhancement we expected to see. Um, and fortunately, the formalism was uh, already derived by Mary Beard. So all we had to do was really just stick in our uh, experimentally measured uh, NM prime cross section um, uh, to understand the effect of this neutron upscattering. You know, if uh, what additional contribution it's going to have to the triple alpha reaction rates. So here we have a 2j plus one uh, factor. So what this is really doing is it's saying, okay, we're getting neutron upscattering from the Hoyle state. We can either go to the ground state or we can go to the first excited state. And because of this 2j plus one factor, the j of the two plus state is obviously two. So this is actually five times more important. Um, so this is where doing the uh, R matrix calculation was really useful because actually what we measure is from the ground state to the Hoyle state. You know, it'll be wonderful, but there's no way for us to measure from the two plus state to the Hoyle state. But we are able to get all of these different reaction cross sections from the R matrix bits. So this is what we see for the rate enhancement at this uh, this uh, density of neutrons, 10 to the 6 grams per cubic centimeter. So at very, very low temperatures, we see that it's not very important. Uh, I think the wrong figure found its way into the slides. But originally what Beard expected is that she saw something that went way up like this around very small temperatures. And this is because of this unrealistic cross section as you just go over the threshold. You know, it's, as you increase the, as you go to very low temperatures, you're really just sampling right near the threshold. As you go to higher temperatures, you're able to see more of the, the higher excited states. So we saw that basically at very small temperatures, you know, don't, it, don't even bother about this. It's, it's not really as important as it's expected to be. And really that was the conclusion that we came to overall. So, uh, this, so there's the two contributions, as I mentioned, there's the upscattering from the Hoyle state to the ground state, which is shown in green. There's the Hoyle state to the two plus, which you can see is more important, that's in black. The some of those is shown in blue. And also shown for reference in red, you know, neutrons aren't the only thing that can actually cause this upscattering. You can also have protons come in and you get some sort of uh, proton upscattering as well. And there's pretty good data for that already. Um, the dotted line for that is shown in red. Um, so you can see that it's basically of the same order of magnitude as this proton upscattering. Um, so what we uh, concluded from this is that this enhancement is not as important as, as it was previously thought to be. And there's really a question about what the actual astrophysical site is where this may even play a role. Um, so 10 to the six grams per uh, cubic centimeter is obviously uh, already a relatively high uh, density. And there's also the question of exactly what temperature you, you have as well. So if you're at very small temperatures, you know, the, the rate enhancement of the Hoyle state is very small, but also the reaction rate, the, the triple alpha reaction rate is going to be very small as well. Okay, so moving on to the conclusions. So we studied the role of neutron elastic scattering to the Hoyle state. And the question that we wanted to answer was whether this neutron upscattering phenomena actually enhances the triple alpha reaction rates. So along the way, this is the first instance of a neutron-induced measurement with an active target TPC. 
And when we looked at the measured cross-section, we saw a much smaller cross-section near this threshold. So this meant that this rate enhancement that was expected to be you know, a factor of 100 bigger is actually heavily suppressed. So the answer to that question is that neutron upscattering is not as important as first expected. And you know, there's the question of whether you can find, you know, cherry pick the exact site or something like that, where this neutron upscattering may play a slight role, um, but it's uh, perhaps hard to find exactly what that site will be. Um, so this uh, was fortunately published with Nature Communications. And uh, you can then start to say, okay, if the triple alpha reaction rate neutron upscattering isn't too important, you know, what other possibilities may there be? So in the carbon-12 alpha gamma, you have this, uh, this uh, higher lying one, one minus state. So the gamma rate decay, decay there is isospin suppressed. So you know, maybe there, there's some sort of neutron upscattering can enhance the radiative decay of this one minus state. But again, I think it's probably a similarly small effect on rate uh, just from some preliminary calculations. Um, but it's something that uh, we may look into in the future. Okay. And just the, the final one sentence summary is that the future of in neutron induced reactions with TPCs is bright and represents many opportunities for astrophysics. So I'd start to thank my collaborators and the project funding and thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, Jack to be perfectly on time. And uh, now let's start, uh, let's start the session for discussion, comments either from the online part or from in presence audience. Yeah, so actually this uh, this is the answer to the question that Abba was asking. So here is the, the reconstructed invariant mass for our data. You can see a, a peak yeah. of the other states. Yes. So thank you very much, very nice talk. So just to, to see if I understood. Anyway, you can see this up upscattering even if you have a kind of sequ sequential decay of this carbon charge. So if you go through beryllium-8 plus alpha, right? Yes, yeah, so yeah, those are kind of decoupled, yeah. This direct, because mm -hmm. of course, so the the branching of this direct is very, very small. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, thank you. Other question? There's a protons. The protons were going up and the neutrons were still going down. Mm -hmm. Why I would expect a large temperature to be the same? Uh, so the reason for that is just because of what our cross section is doing. So we obviously only went up to 10 MeV. And the assumption that we had here is that the cross section was is just flat. Um, so the, the reason it peaks is because you have a resonance here, whereas with the protons, it's kind of more slowly going upwards. Uh, you said that you you have a, a very low energy threshold, 100 kV? Uh, so actually, if I come here, we can go even lower than that. So the... How, how did you manage to do that? Because, you know, in Ganyd, we have Akhtar, but <laughs> the energy threshold was not as low as that. Right. So uh, so for this particular experiment, the, the pad multiplicity requirement was just it has to be hit one pad. And our gain is such that if you have uh, sort of 5 kV or less, then the the signal on that one pad is enough that it fires. Mm, okay. yeah, it's pretty well. Thanks. So other comments or questions? Maybe just a, a very small comment, Jack, from the side. What will be the, the next uh, uh, aims? I mean, the next uh, reaction you want to focus on with uh, TechSat? Uh, so we, we have a lot of stuff going on. Um, so we're looking uh, at utilizing this uh, text ne neutron detector array that I talked about. Um, so we're using that for a variety of different things. So um, one of the things we look at is uh, we do uh, PP scattering. So we populate the isobaric analog state of some system. And we look at the elastic scattering of these iceberg analog states, and we can infer something about the spin parity of those. So what we usually what what is usually done is you do, for instance, lithium nine PP, and uh, you kind of do everything based upon that. But if you also measure the PN, then the uh, the widths of the proton and the neutron are actually confined by the iso spin Klebsch Gordon coefficients. So this is really a more complete way to do it, and that's that's one thing that's. Another very really short question, but perhaps is more for the astrophysicist side. Now, I was just thinking, so we have this helium burning, which is somehow well assessed. Let's say we have a helium <laughs> around 
they just uh, then burn and they give carbon. So the idea is that at some point you might have these uh, thermalized neutrons, so very with low energies, and somehow they can uh, uh, contribute somehow pushing the cross section, right? But then you have this neutron, very high, very energetic coming out that should influence somehow the further nucleosynthesis, right? So, Oscar, can you tell us yeah. something if you might be so that we maybe there might be another observable that we can uh, tackle in order to be sure that this kind of upscattering can play an important role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if you're looking at thermalized neutrons, though, as we uh, as we come here, you can see that um, you know you're already the low energy neutrons are going to be right at the threshold where the cross section is going to zero. So if, if it's, if it's a relatively slow neutron, then I think it's not going to play much role at all. Okay. Um, maybe an answer or partial answer to Aurora's question. The, um, can you go back to your, your rates there as a function of temperature? Um, what would be happening, for example, in a high entropy R process would be you would be you'd be assembling alphas into heavier nuclei around six to eight gigakelvins. Mm -hmm. And um, in an R process environment, in a neutron rich environment, you'd probably actually mostly go through alpha alpha n to make uh, beryllium nine mm -hmm. and then uh, beryllium nine alpha n. So I don't know if I don't know if there's anything in that system that you could look at. Um, uh, so, you know, three body reaction to make alpha, uh, beryllium nine. But the other, the other thing I was thinking about was the fact that at the same time, and you would, you would have a lot of uh, uh, electron positron pairs that could be doing, I don't, I don't know whether they could be doing the same thing and they'd be overwhelming the, uh, the number of those that would be around uh, uh, would be, you know, Hundred times greater than the the number of uh, neutrons or protons. So, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe we can talk about that. But that would be also something. I maybe somebody's looked at that. But that would be yeah. So there idea. there are some electron scattering calculations from the ground states of the Hoyle state. So I think we're going to hear about something similar later. So yeah, I, I, in principle, those those data do exist. Yeah. But that would be the the scale you'd be temperature scale you'd be looking at be like six to six or seven. Okay, you call them, yeah. And somehow this was what that other was pointed out, right? This is a somehow E plus and minus is a pair that might somehow enhance the intersection. Okay. Okay, great. Other questions or comments from digital audience? Nothing? Okay. Oh, is there a hand? Is that, oh, no, it's the max. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So, in with this, uh, let's let us uh, thank uh, Jack and uh, all the other speakers.